first of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining and participating in our webinar series on, <clears throat> on plants as grandparents, doctors, and chefs. Today, uh, uh, and also I would like to uh, thank the American Society for Plant Biology, uh, for plant, of plant biologists, ASPB, for host and its platform for hosting this webinar series. This webinar series, Plants as Grandparents, Doctors and Chefs, organized by the Green Sprout Initiative from Belgium and the Netherlands, will be recorded and also uploaded afterwards on the YouTube channels of the ASPB and also uh, during the Green Sprout Initiative. Today we will have uh, three different. Um, <clears throat> today we will we will be focusing on plant breeding and its history, and we will have three short talks uh, by young plant scientists from the Green Sprout Initiative. Our first speaker will be Nick Vangelo, who's going to talk about plant breeding and, and innovation. As a second speaker, we have Julian Rienstra who is going to talk about plant domestication. And lastly, Savio Rodriguez will inform us about plant, plant transformations and how to actually achieve plant transformation. After each of the different uh, uh, talks, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to us. And also during the talks, we would ask you to use the questions and answer sections in the bottom bar of your of your Zoom window for that. And uh, if you use that, our, our speakers, Nick, Julian, and Savio will also be able to uh, answer questions during presentations of the other speakers. First of all, I, we will start with a small introduction into the organizing initiative, the um, Clean Sprout Initiative from Belgium and, and the Netherlands. And I will try to moderate this evening today. Uh, I'm Svenja Augustine. I just recently started as a member of the Grad School of the Cluster of Excellence in Plant Sciences in Düsseldorf, Germany. And I'm also a board member of uh, Ökoproc, which is a German association for promoting informed policy making on genome editing and plant breeding and agriculture in Europe and particularly Germany. The goals and aims of the Green Sprout Initiative and the association I am a member of are quite similar, and that is why I volunteer to moderate this webinar series today. They are both young researcher in initiatives who promote an open dialogue about the new, pre new plant breeding techniques and the policy of them. Therefore, we like to we would like to inform society and stimulate an open dialogue. All, uh, all organized by young researchers and plant researchers. And in the end, the Green Sprout Initiative also aims to influence to European Uni Union policy on genome editing and genetically modified plants. As an organization and initiative, the Green Sprout Initiative organized before the global pandemic, um, many, many events and discussions in person. And now we switch to online webinars and we organized many discussions, workshops and debates. And also uh, there was a little campaign called Give CRISPR a Chance about the new plant breeding, um, plant breeding methods and uh, genome editing. Mm -hmm. To inform the, the a broad audience on genome editing. They are also active uh, on social media and provide open access information. As you can see here and in, in the end of our presentation of our webinar, one hour webinar today, you will also see handles to different social media channels of them. Now I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker today, who is Nick. Uh, Nick is a recent PhD grad, uh, PhD candidate uh, from um, the YEB in Gent in Belgium, and just recently started to work as a research assistant in um, at the Euroseed Association. When I'm correctly informed, 
in his free time, and I like to point this out, he likes preparing desserts and also eating them. Uh, I'm really happy we have you here today and please start sharing your screen, Nick. Uh, thank you, Svenja, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I am Nick van Heelewe, PhD student in the VIB Ugent Center for Plant Systems Biology, located here in Ghent, Belgium. Um, originally, I was triggered to study biotechnology because of its potential biomedical applications. Um, yet over the years, I developed a strong passion in plant biology, and I'm happy to present to you a small story on the history of plant breeding and the potential of plant breeding innovation. I will start with an introduction on the different aspects related to crop production. And in the next step, I will talk about the developments and different practices of plant breeding. And more importantly, I will elaborate on the relevant aspects of the new plant breeding technique, gene editing, and how this benefits plant science and plant breeding. There are many aspects essential for crop production as depicted, as depicted here in this slide. And we scientists, we mainly focus on um, the crops. And through a process called breeding, breeders develop new crop varieties or introduce new desirable traits, such as, for example, resistance uh, to a certain pest. For most of human history, people have lived as hunter-gatherers, thereby chasing herds of animals and collecting seeds and fruits of edible plants. These habits changed drastically when the first steps of plant domestication were initiated and people became sedimentary. A lot of today's major produced crops, such as wheat and barley, they find its origin some 12,000 years ago in the Near East. And over the next millennia, these early domesticated plants spread rapidly across different the world. However, it is important to note that multiple independent domestication events took place across the world. Uh, summer squash and sunflower, they find, for example, their origin in North America, while rice is traced back to the Yangtze River Basin in China. Plant domestication started a long time ago by farmers who selected the best performing plants in the field. However, it was until the recent discovery of Mendel's laws of hereditary in the 19th century that plant breeding moved from being an art to a science. Breeding became a specialized skill, an expertise, and breeders built a business concept on their efforts. From that point on, scientific breakthroughs in agricultural and biological sciences, they have accelerated. And with this increased understanding of plant biology genetics, plant breeders have const constantly improved their breeding tools to influence uh, and to uh, include a wide variety uh, of uh, new tools. Um, this has, on the other hand, not led to, let's say, a complete replacement of the uh, older tools. The raw material is genetic variability that over millennia has been used to develop and select for new crop varieties or to introduce new traits. Genetic variability or changes in the building blocks of inheritable traits. And those building blocks are called DNA. Savio will elaborate on the genetic transformation method using a bacterium, while Jurian will share with you the applications of precision breeding. What I'm showing you here is the genetic code, basically DNA, just a string of A, C, T, and Gs. And each one of our cells, as well as plant cells, they contain a huge amount of DNA, which we call the genome. And I would need to present to you millions of screens to show you how much DNA is packed in the genome. And through scientific progress, we can mine those millions of pages of DNA. We can find units of inheritable traits, which are called genes. And through research, we are trying to study what each gene does and how it possibly affects a plant in the field. And this genetic diversity can be visible in the plant's phenotype, such as uh, kernel size, color, um, etc., as depicted here uh, in this slide. So generation after generation, small changes in the DNA occur. 
like that change uh, over here or here, a small deletion. So out of the millions and millions of DNA letters, only those five, for example, were deleted. But that is enough to change how a plant looks. Or perhaps take a look at this little G uh, over here. That can change into an A. And when that happens, also the characteristics of a plant can change. For example, that plant is now resistant to a certain disease. Selective breeding is based on these DNA changes that occur spontaneously. However, only a few of those DNA changes, they resulted in desirable traits or crop varieties and have been selected for over time. About 2,500 years ago, Brassica loraceae was solely a wild plant that grew along the coast of Britain, France and countries in the Mediterranean. That wild form, which stick exists, is known as wild mustard and is presented here on top. In its uncultivated form, it is also called wild cabbage. Through selection for various phenotype traits, the emergence of variations of the plants with drastic differences in its look took only a few thousand years. So preferences, for example, for leaves, terminal buds, a lateral bud, stem and inflorescence, they resulted in the selection of varieties of wild cabbage into the many forms of that we know today. And there are actually several sources offering data um, about food consumption, for example, during the 16th century, such as cookbooks or paintings, as well as archaeological discoveries of food remains, such as seeds. And they can give an impression of the kinds of food that were available and consumed. This painting is entitled Market Scene and was made in 1569 by the Dutch painter Peter Aertsen. And as you can see, the lady here is holding a cabbage head indicating that this was available in the Netherlands in the 16th century. Researchers have been searching for ways to accelerate genetic variability by means of including DNA changes artificially. How do we proceed? Well, we take seeds of a certain plant and treat it either with radiation or chemicals. This will result in randomly induced DNA changes, illustrated here in red colored DNA letters. For example, in wheat, this easily results in 500,000 changes and hopefully, one of them will be useful and will give a desirable trait to the plant. The widespread use since 1928 has resulted in thousands of novel crop varieties. Researchers, they have continued to search for more specific ways to accelerate genetic variability. And gene editing is a relative new technology and is an example of how fundamental science with a touch of creativity can lead to exciting new applications. Many researchers employ genome editing with CRISPR due to its simplicity. It's an exciting time. CRISPR fits in the context of plant breeding in the following way. In this case, we have a certain plant. And what we try to do is to make a specific change in the DNA that will be targeted to a specific gene that is important for a certain trait. Actually, we can think of CRISPR as a word processor. We have a search engine and a molecular editor. It's just like a find and replace tool as depicted here. Through the millions and millions of pages of DNA, we can search with a short string of DNA for a specific location within the genome and target and change that DNA with the molecular editor. Now, how do these changes look? Well, I showed you this genetic code before. So when we are doing CRISPR, we obtain the following. For example, a deletion, perhaps here, eh, of five DNA letters, or perhaps that G over there, we can change it into an A. In other words, gene editing enables precision breeding. Now we have a technology to make specific changes to a plant's DNA. And with this find and replace tool, we are no longer reliant on randomly induced genetic variability. In addition, this molecular tool is very precise and it provides us with the highest level of control over the introduced DNA changes. And I think that one of the most impressive features of genome editing is that it's efficient. Certain rather complex and quantitative traits that are dependent on multiple DNA changes, well, now it's feasible. 
to obtain the desired plant variety or trait in only one or two generations of a plant. The plant Arabdopsis thaliana, also known as tailcress, it has been extensively used as a model in plant molecular biology. And in other words, the mutation breeding method was used to introduce genetic variability. So by, by for example, treatment of seeds of Arabdopsis with the chemical EMS. As a result, many Arabdopsis plants uh, were generated that have different effects. For example, defects in flower development. And this has resulted in the famous genetic ABC model of flower development, which is taught to the next generation of plant scientists all across the world. Well, one of the flower mutants in Arabdopsis here is um, the cauliflower mutant. And this plant is no longer able to develop normal looking flowers because it has two genes that do no longer function, Apitala 1 and cauliflower. Well, as you can see, these flowers are very similar to the cauliflower yeah, that we now as a vegetable. These Arabdopsis cauliflowers, they are a result of the fact that the plant cells are not able to differentiate into the cells that form a flower organ. They keep on dividing without differentiation. So this flower uh, is actually showing that a cauliflower is nothing but a flower mutant. What is now interestingly is that there is a homolog of the Arabidopsis cauliflower in the Brassica oleraceae varbotritis. And based on the analysis of the DNA sequence, it has been revealed that there is a slight change in this uh, gene, which results in a premature stop codon. So in other words, the cauliflower gene is no longer functional in cauliflower, and that makes it uh, a cauliflower as well. So, um, in other words, through basic science, we can explain, in some cases, the domestication of plants. Many researchers in Europe, like me, they have been using gene editing to increase genetic variability in an advanced way, to study the function of genes, to develop new varieties, or to introduce new desirable traits, which of some of them can contribute to the challenges related to sufficient, sustainable, and healthy food production. I think it's exciting to imagine what will scientific knowledge and breeding bring us in the future. So I would like to thank uh, ASPB to host this event and I would like to uh, thank you for attending this presentation. I would like to thank the Gene Sprout Initiative team for their support and commitment to science communication. Thank you so much, Nick, for your presentation. It was really, really nice to see this. And I'm always really happy to see what kind of phenotypic effects small mutations can have, such as this cauliflower mutant. I think it's a really, really cute mutation and having a, a, nice, a nicely visible effect. Since there are no questions within the Q&A section, uh, we can directly continue with our next uh, speaker today, for today. Just as a small uh, so short reminder, whenever you have a question, you, you are always welcome to share it with us in the questions and answers section below the, uh, in, on the bottom of the, um, of the window of your Zoom presentation. Now I would like to introduce our second speaker for today, who is Julian, Julian Rienstra, and he is a PhD candidate at the Department of Biochemistry at Wageningen University. In his research, he's mainly focused on plant hormones and plant architecture, and as a member of the Green Sprout Initiative, he's just like Nick, an outspoken person about potential positive effects of the applications of genome editing, and he tries to promote information-based policymaking. And according to our plan, today he will tell us more about plant domestication, a process Nick already referred to in his presentation. Jürgen, will you start yeah. sharing? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes, we see it, but now it should be full screen. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Nick, for already introducing uh, plant domestication a bit and uh, how uh, precision breeding works exactly. 
what I want to cover in this uh, talk is a little bit about the history of plant domestication to make you familiar with the term, but also to give you a few use cases of precision breeding. I noticed that uh, a lot of times we talk about uh, hyper hypotheticals that we say we can do a lot of stuff with precision breeding but it's not really tangible because there's not really a lot of examples so in this case what i want to show you is a few examples of what scientists have so far been doing with precision breeding it's by no means exhaustive we have uh, plants the science community has done a lot of stuff with precision breeding but i think it's a few examples that are really cool so before I give you the examples, I need to explain to you what the process of domestication is exactly. And I loosely define it here as the process of selecting or breeding for traits in a plant that are beneficial to humans. Um, if we consider the two plants over here, we, oh, sorry, I'll quickly make it a pointer. We have a plant that's a, uh, that produces berries and we have our classical grains. And uh, the trait I want to focus on, for instance, is that uh, in both cases, uh, it's very, uh, it's not really beneficial to us humans if a plant loses its fruits and it falls on the ground, or when, in the case of our grains, the grains fall on the ground, uh, and yeah, and, and they fall on the ground, because they normally in nature the animals would take these fruits and seeds and spread them around, but that's of course not really what we want, because that makes harvesting them a lot more difficult. So we have actively in the last 10,000 years for all of our crop plants, looked for mutations um, without knowing that these mutations were on the DNA uh, to look for the mutations that would uh, have the fruits or the grains remain on the plant. And that's not the only trait we've looked for. We also look for others. But what I find interesting here is that in both plants that have fruits and plants that have grains, we looked for traits that did not scatter their seeds. And this is what we called convergent domestication. It means that we look for the same traits in several plant species because this trait is always beneficial to us. So that's not only the seed shattering, but that's also, for instance, uh, the loss of daylight dependence so that our plants will always flower and produce fruits or seeds when we want them to, instead of having to rely on a certain season. Uh, if we look, for instance, at the, at the grain crops that we grow, maize, wheat and rice, we've looked for three different traits that make them the most used plants in the world. And that is semi-dwarfs, shatterproof and high yield. All of these traits are shared by these three plants. And what's more interesting is that in the last uh, couple of decades, we have found the genetic basis for these domestication traits uh, that they are the same in several species. Now, why is this important? Now, it means if we know how a semi-dwarf in rice is caused, for instance, we can now use precision breeding to also cause a similar uh, trait in other kind of crops. And I want to show you that with my first example, and that is the domestication of a wild tomato species. I think we're all familiar with uh, the current tomato that is, grow that is grown everywhere and you can find in the supermarket, but Compared to those tomatoes, wild tomatoes are often resistant to environmental stress and insect and pathogens because they have to. They are not grown in a greenhouse where we keep them safe and we uh, make sure that there are no insects in the greenhouse and we make sure that the conditions are optimal. They have to survive outside and that means that they're very hard plants. In principle, they would be optimal then to start growing, but unfortunately they also have small fruits and they grow in vines. But, as I said, we also have a lot of knowledge about our current tomato and we know exactly which genes uh, are actually responsible for producing the tomato as we know it. And in the two papers that are quoted uh, over here, what they did is that they took the wild tomato over here, uh, WT stands for wild type, so that's the, the wild tomato species background, and by making the fasciated muted, mutant, they increase the amount of chambers in each fruit. And that is already one step in producing bigger fruits uh, than, the, than the wild tomato species. What's also interesting is that if you uh, make the mutation self-pruning, the plant becomes a lot less small in statute, which means that harvesting is a lot easier and it requires less manual labor to string up the plant around the central, uh, central stalk. 
And finally, they made the mutation multiflora, which means that on each branch of flowers, you actually get secondary branches that form even more flowers. So think about that. That's just three different mutations. And already it has such a dramatic effect on not only how the plant looks like, but also how big the tomatoes are. And definitely with some extra knowledge and extra mutations, we could even improve this uh, wild tomato even further. Now, one other way that we can use this, uh, use this technique is to accelerate domestication of so-called orphan crops. And I give an example here of ground cherry. Ground cherry uh, in its Latin name is Physalis prunosa, and it's an orphan crop of Central and South America. So we don't really know it as a crop here, but over there they grow these crops primarily because the small berries have a very nice pineapple flavor. But like the wild tomato, it has a vine-like growth and the fruits are very tiny and they also abscise from the stems, which means that they fall on the ground. Uh, luckily for us, it's related to tomato, which means that any of the knowledge that we had from previous research, just like with the wild tomato, we can instantly apply in the domestication of ground cherry. And that's exactly what they did over here. The first thing is that they made the same mutation as in the wild tomato, the self-pruning mutation, and you observe that there are suddenly a lot more flowers forming around the main stem. Secondly, they made a the clavata one mutation, which increased the amount of locules in the fruit from two to three. Oh. And finally, they made a mutation in the erecta gene, which means that also these plants are now suddenly a lot smaller. And I think this is already showing that with a few simple techniques with precision breeding, you can instantly change the architecture of the plant and make it way more useful in agriculture systems. But why is accelerated domestication important exactly? Why can't we just stay with our own plants that we have? Well, as I show over here, there is an enormous variation in nature and in different cultures. The picture I show over here are a bunch of varieties of potatoes found in Peru. In Peru, they grow over 3,000 different species of potato. And it's very important that we maintain this diversity, not only as a pool of new variation and traits, but also because there's a cultural aspect to, uh, to these plants. Unfortunately, with climate change, uh, climate change happening as it is, it will put a lot of pressure on these varieties because places where they used to grow might suddenly not be, uh, not be the best uh, conditions anymore for these plants to grow. So if we know, uh, now that we've seen the uh, previous two slides, now if we know how we can adapt one tomato potato plant to a specific condition, we might be able to use this knowledge to our advantage and start precision breeding in the other potato species as well. And in that case, precision breeding could be used in maintaining these varieties rather than being lost forever because they simply had not enough yields or were unable to grow in the face of climate change. And this could help then to maintain or even improve the biodiversity of the crop plants that we have. Now, another example that I want to give is urban and vertical farming. We see over the last few decades that more and more people start living in cities and these cities become bigger and bare. Uh, of course, these cities need to be supplied with fresh produce every day. And this produce is often comes from farms that are kilometers away or even countries away. So there's a huge long supply chain to get these products from wherever they're grown into the cities. And not only that, these products are often harvested when they're unripe so that they don't damage during the transport. So there's also a huge carbon cost associated to it and you don't really necessarily get the best product. If we can somehow start farming inside the cities, we could shorten these supply chains, which has a lot less carbon, uh, carbon footprint, and you could, be, uh, you, could, uh, you could buy fresh produce every day. And one way to do this is by vertical farming. I think uh, these two pictures already highlighted. By the use of hydroponics, LED lights, and AI, we could, uh, artificial intelligence, we could optimize this kind of growing uh, to, yeah, incredibly. And the nice thing here is that it's basically a few farms stacked on top of each other. So you don't need a whole bunch of uh, space to grow all of these plants. You can also grow them in a factory that is, uh, that's not in use anymore. But of course, before you can do that, you also need to, uh, to produce 
uh, varieties that you can actually use for vertical farming or actually for growing them inside your house. I like this paper a lot because they show that by stacking different mutations, when you go from the wild type again and you introduce the self-pruning gene, you introduce a second self-pruning gene, and finally you also mutate the erecta gene, the same three mutations that we saw in previous slides, you suddenly have a tomato plant that grows a bunch of small cherry tomatoes. And in this paper, they also showed that these tomato plants can indeed be grown vertically. So that's maybe in one day, we can grow these tomatoes in a huge city and have fresh tomatoes every day. Well, I hope that with these slides, I have shown you that precision breeding is a promising tool to safeguard our plant's biodiversity rather than losing it, uh, losing it to uh, one, uh, one potato species that takes ages to breed. Uh, it can help in maintaining regional varieties and it can domesticate orphan crops. I showed ground cherry, but there are a lot of plants that are very specific to cultures that I simply don't have any commercial value to companies. Um, and I want to say uh, that new plant breeding techniques, of which precision breeding is one, are not the only solution, but will definitely play a key role in making agriculture more sustainable. And with that, I'd like to thank Plantea and ASPB for hosting us. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, so far, we haven't received any questions for your presentation yet, but I would like to remain every uh, and any participant listening to us uh, to post questions in the questions and answers section uh, in the below bar of the Zoom window. Um, but as there are no questions in there yet, I would again oh, directly introduce our third and last speaker for today, Savio Rodriguez, who is a, plant, a PhD candidate in, um, in the Laboratory of Plant Health and Protection in Leuven in Belgium. And there he is for, uh, researching the interaction between plants and pathogenic bacteria. He's very interested in understanding this Nature's genetic and engineer, a bacterium we, we will be hearing a lot about uh, during his talk today, and horizontal gene transfer. I know that he's uh, <laughs> he's also uh, he also collects uh, various various numbers of different sneakers, and I'm really happy to hear about horizontal gene transfer and acrobacterium, a specific natural gene technology expert from you. Uh, thank you, uh, Svenja, for that nice introduction. Um, I will just present my screen now. Uh, I hope it is um, on uh, everybody's uh, desktop. Uh, so, uh, well, basically, my name is uh, Savio Rodriguez, and I'm a PhD student at Kai Leuven working on agrobacterium. I also uh, volunteer for Gene Sprout Initiative in their message for uh, promoting new plant breeding techniques uh, in uh, agriculture. And today I wanted to talk about a tool that is often used in transforming plants, that is agrobacterium, which we will call nature's genetic engineer. Uh, Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what is plant transformation? Well, basically, it's the practice of transforming plants that exhibit desired traits or characteristics. You might have gathered this from the uh, presentations of Urian and Nick, that traits such as resistance to diseases or tolerance to heat, heat stress or cold stress are uh, valuable traits that would be uh, worthwhile to breed into plants as we approach um, the development uh, towards a sustainable future with global warming. So why transform plants? Well, basically it offers a whole plethora of advantages. They can be used to provide resistance to pests or pathogens, to tolerate harsh environments, to also increase the nutritional value of consumed foods, such as higher vitamin A or vitamin C, to increase the yields of the uh, crop in the field, or to produce pharmaceuticals within plants. How is plant transformation done now, you might ask? Well, basically there are 
Two commonly used tools in today's day is the gene gun, which is used in a technique called particle bombardment or biolistics, and the biological way of transforming plants, which is using a bacteria known as acrobacterium. So first I would like to talk about uh, biolistics or particle bombardment using a gene gun. And uh, I just, um, I'm sorry. Yes, so a gene gun is basically, you could think of it as a shotgun, which blasts off gold nanoparticles coated with DNA into the plant. And when these uh, enter into the nucleus of the plant where the plant's DNA is held, these DNA fragments integrate with the plant genome, providing the information carried on those DNA fragments to the plant. Yeah, Acrobacterium is on the other hand a soil dwelling bacteria which has been found to be capable of also transforming plants and it basically can send DNA fragments held within its plasmid into the plants and lead to the transformation of plants. So um, you might be thinking how now does the Acrobacterium transform the plant? So here is a scanning electron microscope of some acrobacterium attached to a plant tissue. And I will play a small video. Hmm. So uh, you might be wondering um, how does agrobacterium transform plants so that uh, video I hope conveyed that information. And now uh, with, uh, you might be thinking what plants have been transformed by agrobacterium. So currently there are several plants that have been transformed by agrobacterium such as sugar beets, sugarcane, plums, wheat, maize, soybean, rice, plenty of plants have been, uh, it's a widely used plant transformation uh, uh, tool and it's, um, um, it's, it's generally regarded as a clean way of producing uh, transformed plants. Uh, the use of this technology has been around since the 1980s and uh, the first transformed plant arose in 1983. But, uh, oh, So, what is the ability to transform plants a human invention? Well, the answer is no. Uh, I'm sure most of you while walking around in a park or in a forest would have observed tumor-like growths on uh, woody trees, such as uh, this out here or this out here. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, these tumor-like trees were found to be uh, 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 produced by uh, uh, the uh, members of the agrobacterium family. And uh, it was only in the 1970s that uh, researchers were able to decipher how agrobacterium causes these plant tumors to develop. It was, it was found that agrobacterium transfers the tDNA and when uh, researchers removed the tDNA out of the uh, agrobacterium, it was classified as a non-oncogenic agrobacterium because it does not form any tumors. And when this tDNA is replaced by another tDNA, it can help with the generation of those traits in the plant. Another disease caused by agrobacterium is something known as heavy root disease, and it causes the plants to produce tremendous amounts of roots in an uncontrolled uh, manner. Uh, so why does agrobacterium do this, you might ask? Well, basically, when the tDNA is transformed in the plant, the roots turn into a factory 
of or the infected plant tissue turns into a factory for the production of nutrients that the plants require and this uh, uh, sorry nutrients the acrobacterium require and these nutrients uh, provide a competitive edge for the bacteria in the rhizosphere so here the agrobacterium somehow manages to transform the plant and, con and con converts it into an opine producing factory. And this causes other agrobacterium to uh, grow and outcompete the other microorganisms in the uh, rhizosphere. Okay, cool. But we don't consume these crown gals or hairy roots, right? Well, basically, there are plenty of examples of naturally transformed plants that we have been commonly using. Uh, and which have been shown to possess uh, agrobacterium related genes such as the neem tree, the cranberries, carnations, sweet potato, guava, tobacco, hops used for beer production, tea, walnuts, peanuts. Uh, so some final thoughts. Well, agrobacterium is a well-known bacteria with over 120 years of research behind it, but only recently have we found that agrobacterium has been transforming and exploiting plants much before the domestication of plants by humans occurred. So my take home messages that I would like to impart from this presentation is genetic engineering of plants have been occurring far before human intervention. Our ancestors have unknowingly included agrobacterium transformed plants in plant breeding research, and we have been consuming them for millennia. They are definitely safe for human consumption. And humans replace the tumor forming capabilities of the agrobacterium, which is the bad part, and replaced it with good DNA fragments which provide plants with desirable traits that would benefit society. So with that, I would like to end my presentation and I would like to thank you for your uh, attendance. Thank you so much, Savio. I'm really happy about your presentation and uh, yeah, GMOs, uh, naturally occurring GMOs that are safely for safe for human use for millennia now. <laughs> I, I always found the um, the example with the sweet potato quite striking in this context where you have a horizontal gene transfer that happened thousands of hundreds or thousands of years ago, a long time ago. A few millennium, uh, a few million years ago, in fact. So, agrobacterium has been domesticating plants, in my opinion, far before humans even <laughs> got into the scene for their own purpose. <laughs> Wow. We had our first question within the uh, Q&A section and uh, sin, uh, despite the fact that Julian already answered it in part uh, via the chat function, I would like to discuss it with all three of our speakers today. Um, Yon Ting Kao asked, how do we maintain biodiversity when we mass produce the modified crops? So I think that is a general concern that is often raised. How do we get a balance between biodiversity and genetic diversity too, uh, and uh, un uh, synchronize plant growth yield in agriculture that we want? Yeah, I think I answered that question already. Um, I, I would argue that uh, using precision breeding, because it is much cheaper and faster uh, than conventional breeding, what we can do with it is that uh, once we know how we can modify one particular potato plant to increase the yield, for instance, uh, we can use the same knowledge to apply it to all the local varieties. And I, I'm not sure if we will ever have one variety that is grown everywhere around the world. There's so many different climates, so many different soil types that I don't think, uh, even different altitudes, of course, that I don't think that one plant will ever fit all. So there will still be the need for locally adapted yeah. crops we plant and use. Yeah, and you see it already. Uh, if, you, um, if you look at the, the, how do you call that? Like the booklets of the plant breeding companies, they have sometimes thousands varieties of tomato species that they uh, sell to farmers. So uh, precision breeding would just uh, improve on that rather than, um, yeah, that we have to worry about one variety being sold everywhere. So you think that uh, the um, opening of genome edit of uh, the agricultural market for genome edited 
crops in Europe would lead to a diversification of planted crops in the end. Yeah, I think so. Because because it's more uh, easier to to get the domestication traits into a new variety. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I would like to continue with the next question. Uh, an anonymous attendee asked, uh, how long would it take to introduce a trait through these new breeding techniques in comparison with traditional breeding? I think that one's for, for you, Nick. Yeah, thank you, Svenja, for the question. Um, it depends, of course, how you define traditional breeding. Um, I, th I think it's important because, uh, when it is communicated about uh, genome editing um, that uh, this method, it still becomes part of the breeding cycle, meaning uh, that you will need to um, screen and grow hundreds of plants and select in the end um, the plants that have the, the most interesting, let's say, genetic makeup. Um, However, for example, there are interesting cases like, uh, for example, with uh, polyploidy species like wheat, which have six copies of the same gene. And um, there, there is a huge potential for, for genome editing and for making, for example, then these six copies not functional anymore. For example, resistance to a certain fungus. Um, so I think we can talk uh, relatively easily about years that we would save, but it depends from the application. Mm -hmm. I I think also I also think that it uh, will increase in the the frequency with which we receive new varieties, and I like to think this in context with a rapidly changing climate, with climate change, where we will need plants that are adapted to new environmental conditions more more faster and and quicker. Savio, I think we got a new question for you. Uh, it's from Ying Chao, who asked um, what you think about the new plant gene, uh, new plant gene transformation technologies, such as nanotech-based transformation. Can you please explain what is nanotech uh, transformation, and then your opinion on that? Well. Uh... I would think it's some form of biolistics, right? Uh, with nanoparticles being covered with DNA molecules and that's being shot into your plant. Uh, so I am sorry, I just look at the question again. Um, it's now in the answer section. Okay. Yeah, so agrobacterium is traditionally widely regarded as uh, the ideal plant transformation tool uh, because it has a, a dramatic host range, a really big host range. Unfortunately, there are some plants that cannot be transformed by agrobacterium, which means that they are recalcitrant to plant transformation. Some common examples would be monocot monocotyledonous plants, uh, such as maize, or uh, rice or wheat, which have been hurdles in plant transformation using agrobacterium, but that has also been conquered, I would say, at this point. So uh, the use of biolistics, in my in my opinion, using nanoparticles is not really required, or uh, or should be or should be used when agrobacterium mediated transformation is not a possibility, uh, because it's a really straightforward application. And um, yeah. Okay. Thank I can you, keep. Savio. I can keep monologuing, so I will stop <laughs> myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just don't know many of the plant transformation techniques. I've only used Acrobacterium and and trying to put flowers in that in in a solution with a horizontal oh, gene transfer doing bacterium. Yeah. One, one more thing that I would like to say also, with agrobacterium-based transformation, when the tDNA is transferred to the plant, one copy or two copies or three copies are transferred to the plant genome. Whereas when you use a nanoparticle-based approach, where you just, it's like a shotgun, right? So it just blasts DNA molecules into the thing. So you cannot really control how much copies of the gene you want to introduce also 
within your, that could also have a dramatic effect on how the plant phenotype turns out, whether one copy of the gene is there or more. Okay. Uh, after that, we have a new question from Yan Ting Tao. Uh, and I think Nick is going to uh, be quite well for this. Uh, he asked uh, if it is possible to let the general public to submit their idea for modifying crops and cr increase public en engagement. So we are in science communication and uh, what to do with crops. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very uh, interesting question. And I have to admit actually that the Genes Sprout Initiative has not considered <laughs> to open a call for, uh, let's say, creating new uh, traits or, or new crop varieties um, based on, on what the public uh, thinks. Um, just what I would like to add is that I think that there is now, um, given let's say what's at stake regarding um, uh, the climate change and sustainability, that we are questioning really like um, how are we going to produce food uh, in the future. Um, and there is a lot of public consultation on that. And uh, I think, let's say, with the Gene Sprout, we are mainly focusing now on, on informing people to, to enable them to, to, to voice also their uh, opinion. Um, and actually, I, I think it would be very nice to assess how do, uh, let's say, citizens uh, consider that our food uh, would be produced? Because we, we sense like that there is more and more a disconnection happening uh, related to, uh, to this food production. So yeah, maybe we should think about a grant call to uh, related to a citizens project uh, where we will develop a potential um, gene edited crop based on what the public think might be useful. But I think, Yurian uh, made some very nice examples with showing that look, even not only digitalization or, or like urban farming itself, um, uh, you need all the tools, not only mechanically, but also how can we adapt the plants accordingly to, to be able to do vertical farming or um, urban farming efficiently. I don't know if Yurian maybe would like to add something to that. No, I think you covered it pretty well, but yeah, indeed, you need specific varieties to be able to grow vertically. They have to be short. Uh, and like you see with the tomato, uh, as an example, uh, those would be prime candidates for vertical farming. Okay, thank you, Julian and Nico, for your, your answers to this question. Uh, we have a new question from Chang Yang Yu Wang. Uh, who asked whether we use cultivars or lab used wild type uh, for CRISPR genome editing. And I think it depends on the purpose, but uh, I would hope for yeah. the speakers to have an answer to that. I can shortly answer that a little bit. It's, it's, it really depends indeed. Uh, usually it's a lab used wild type because that's what most people are familiar with. Uh, if you look at Arabidopsis, what uh, that we use a lot for our research, there's one plant that we have one variety that we use in particular, and the others we kind of ignore. Uh, I previously tried using agrobacterium that Savio was mentioning to transform other varieties of Arabidopsis, and some of them are very difficult to transform. And if they're difficult to transform, it's of course also difficult to use precision breeding. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but for proof of principle, uh, so I think for proof of principle uh, topics like the, the domestication of the, the wild tomato, I think that works perfectly. And then the next step would be to apply this kind of research into other varieties. Okay, thank you uh, for, for, for answering the question, Julian. We, we also have a comment from Petra Joras uh, about the numbers of uh, plant varieties that are registered each year in the European Union and maybe Nick can talk about this in some more detail. detail. Um, well I'm still let's say learning the immense diversity that, that, that is available but um, uh, as actually Petra Joras here um, shared is that there are in total now about um, for, uh, it's really a lot, uh, 24,000 different varieties available. 
And apparently, so every year, about 3,500 new plant varieties are registered. So, so th there is already a lot um, of uh, diversity uh, present and many um, options that the farmers can choose. But I think this relates also to um, what downstream factors of the, of the value chain expect and, and especially consumers. So possibly the bottleneck in um, agriculture and biodiversity in agriculture isn't the plant breeding side right now, but the application. Um, I'm I'm interested in that too. But I like the uh, I like that we already talked a lot about uh, different traits we can introduce with um, genome and precision editing, and also what kind of new traits are possible with a horizontal gene transfer that Savio mentioned. Um, maybe we can just short, briefly each of us uh, say, tell one example we would like to see for plant breeding in the future and uh, also one small limitation. And after that, we will close our webinar for today. Savio, would you like to start maybe? Sure. Um, so um, one potential, uh, can, could you please repeat the question? <laughs> uh, uh, your favorite application uh, you would like to see for genome editing in the future in plant breeding? Uh, well, um, I would say, I would highly stress that uh, global warming is um, current threat. And the problem that comes up with it is that many diseases that were once contained in the tropical regions or the warmer regions are now coming into more temperate zones, such as from uh, the Mediterranean climate to the more European climate, right? And we really need to figure out ways to help society cope with this um, as we advance. By 2030, we have uh, the United Nations Sustainable Goals to end world hunger. And um, through the use of plant, uh, new plant breeding techniques, I think this would be definitely a feasibility. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I think that is a really cool thing to do with plant breeding and uh, also a thing that you could more easily achieve with Decision with precision plant breeding. Now our hour is somewhat up, and I am sad that we won't hear any more examples from Julian and Nick. But I would like uh, at the end uh, again thank the Gene Sprout Initiative, so all three of you as speakers for today, and the American Society for Plant, Bi of plant Biologists (ASPB) for hosting this webinar series. And as it is a series, I would also point out that we have new and um, a follow-up webinar next week on Tuesday, um, where we will talk about plant health and their medicines, a topic that uh, Savio already um, mentioned a few seconds ago. And if you like the Green Sprout uh, Initiative, and found them some <laughs> nice. Uh, I would also recommend uh, checking them out on their various uh, social media accounts, like uh, where they try to empower people to develop informed opinions, like on, on Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also, of course, via email. So thank you all for attending today. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you for ASPB and see you next week on Tuesday.